Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Conor Brady. Um, I am a pre-owned newspaper editor, uh, and I am joined here on the panel this morning by what I might describe as some of the most eminent thought leaders in the uh, serious end of the Irish news media. Um, they, uh, um, they are uh, Nigel Hamilton, um, who is the uh, editor of the, uh, sorry, Sebastian Hamilton, who is the editor of the um, Irish Daily Mail, not to be confused with uh, the counterpart title on the adjoining island. Um, I have Ian Kyo, uh, who is the editor of the Sunday Business Post. Uh, David Nally, um, who is the managing editor of RTE Current Affairs. And uh, Paul O'Neill, who is uh, the recently appointed editor of the Irish Times, a parish with which I have some familiarity. And, of course, Fanon Sheehan, um, who will be known to many of you from uh, television appearances, apart from the fact that he is the editor of the Irish Independent. So, we do have a, uh, an issue of gender balance up here, um, but since uh, Darvla is taking over the next one, I think we'll just have to endure that for the, for the, for the, for the moment. A few preliminary comments, if I may. Um, the reporting of Brexit, uh, if I still had a newspaper to run, I think would, I would probably regard it as one of the uh, greatest challenges uh, that, that, that could face uh, a news, news organisation. I would put it on a, on a par with reporting the, uh, the peace process in, 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 in Northern Ireland over, over all of those many years. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panellists uh, to speak for anything up to about uh, seven minutes each. I uh, won't let them more than that. Uh, we might take some preliminary comments as we go through and then we'll open it up to questioning uh, around the floor and we will uh, reach coffee at a quarter to twelve. Um, a few prelim preliminary comments and questions which might just help to, to, to set us thinking a little bit. Um, I, I suppose the first question I would ask myself about um, the media as we face into, but the serious end of the news media, as we, as we face into this um, voyage, uh, this journey, is um, are the media up to it? Are they adequate? Have they got the... Um, have they got the the um, the capacity resources to uh, report the news, to analyse it, to evaluate, to um, to validate positions which will be put up, um, particularly at a time when resources are so badly squeezed, and um, every one of the editors here uh, with me, I know will be grappling with the reality that uh, revenues are down, the traditional business model of the media is broken, and it's a constant struggle to actually uh, provide the sort of services that, that, are, that are necessary uh, to cover the, the news seriously, particularly in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a small market such as ours. Um, I would particularly ask have the news media got the capacity not just to report Brexit, but at the same time to report the many other things, and this has been touched on in the earlier session, the other things that are happening within the European Union, and, and, and some of those are moving along very rapidly. You already have uh, Macron and uh, Merkel talking about treaty change. So it's not just all about Brexit. It's about watching what's happening in the parallel places as well. I suppose the second question I would ask is, uh, do the editors feel, and is our media uh, equipped to resist what I would call the British disease, or more accurately, the English disease, uh, which we saw in what I would describe as the quite appalling abdication of uh, professional standards and professional responsibility in the media coverage, most of the, of the, of the London media, not all, there were exceptions, um, in, the, in the Brexit referendum uh, this time last year, and indeed since. Uh, and I suppose the third uh, thought I would throw out would be um, 
Is there in fact a bias within our media? Because a lot of people seem to think that there is a bias in relation to uh, Europe. Within these walls, I have heard people, serious people, sit around the table and say the news media are utterly biased against the European Union, uh, that they are out to tear it down by its foundations, and that we don't seem to be able to get a fair crack of the whip uh, from, the, from, from the news media. Uh, they're obsessed with things like officials' expenses and who travels on what plane and uh, who's getting what out of what fund. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, we hear that the news media are simply uh, slavish, uh, craven um, adulators of the European Union and that they have no capacity for serious criticism uh, or, or questioning. So, just a few preliminary thoughts. Having said that, uh, I'm going to go right to um, our speakers and uh, I'm first going to call on Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Hamilton, the editor of the Irish Daily Mail. Thanks very much. Um, I'm actually very grateful to Connor for pointing out to start with the, the difference between the Irish Daily Mail, the UK Daily Mail. In case anybody here doesn't know, the UK Daily Mail was pro Brexit. The Irish Daily Mail, the Irish Mail, Mail Sunday opposed Brexit for the very simple reason that it is bad for our readers, uh, who are the people that we care about and who we serve. Um, and in fact, not only that, it was the Irish Daily Mail which <coughs> launched the campaign to have a dedicated Irish Brexit minister. Uh, may not have been universally approved of by the establishment, but I think that the underlying point was a demonstration of the vigour and dynamism with which the Brexit issue needed to be addressed. And I have to say, I think congratulations are due particularly to the, the Irish Diplomatic Corps for what they've achieved on that front uh, and, the, and the prominence that's been given to the point that we made in calling for a Brexit minister, which was, you know, Ireland is uniquely affected by Brexit and has to be treated uniquely by everybody in this, and they've done a phenomenal job in, in addressing that. As we now move into the kind of reality stage, I think we have, well, not a Brexit minister, we've seen Simon Coveney given a kind of special status with regards to Brexit, and I, I think that is also a powerful indication that, that this is being taken seriously enough at the highest levels. Um, to me, the key word in all of this is reality, because uh, I think we saw a little bit of this in the discussion previously about the border. One of the great issues for me is the, is the divorce between what we're being told by the politicians, what we're being told generally in discussion about what's, what's going to happen and the hard realities of making that work. Uh, and I think we touched on that with the border, which is we, are, we keep being told invisible border, seamless border. But actually, when you look at the realities of that, nobody has come up with a concrete set of proposals as to how that could actually work. And if you look even even at international precedent, you know, the border between Norway and Sweden, which is highly technological, very close, even they still have customs checks. And it, and it filters across into, you know, I think everybody's focused in terms of a, of a seamless border on the main border crossing uh, on the motorway from Dublin to Belfast. Has anybody asked what happens to all the other minor roads? Because if, if there are custom checks on the main border crossing points, you can't surely have open roads elsewhere. So I think the key thing here is for the media at all times, whenever we're being told what the aspirations are, to be challenging that on a, on a, on a straightforward level, on what I would call a, not just a critical thinking level, and applying critical thought to the proposals, but a common sense level. How is that actually going to work? And <coughs> that applies not just to the question of the border. We've all taken for granted, I think, that the common travel area is just a given because everybody says they would like one. Uh, 
you know, Ireland wants one, Britain wants one, and the EU is, is, is clearly part of the disorder. But have we asked, have we really challenged whether that's going to be feasible and whether the EU can sign up to a treaty which would grant preferential status to one group of citizens over another? You know, my, under a common travel area, my wife and kids will be able to go over to Britain and do what they want, but our neighbours next door in Sutton who are French don't have the same rights. How's that? Is that going to be workable? Is that compatible with EU law? It may be, but I think it falls on the media to ask these questions uh, and to constantly be challenging what any government is saying, what any group of politicians are saying, on behalf of the ordinary citizens who, who we represent. And, um, you know, again, you have to understand that within any negotiation, the people negotiating are going to see things through their own prism and they're going to present things in their own light. I, when I used to go to EU summits uh, for Sunday business, Alistair Campbell would come out and give his post-summit briefing and it'd tell you this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. And most of the UK media would dutifully transcribe that and assume that's what happened. If you went and talked to other members, I used to go and talk to the Finns, um, who are just great fun, and if you speak a bit of Finnish, like I do, <laughs> they love the fact that someone outside, but, and I would tell them what Alistair Campbell had said had happened at the summit, and they would roar with laughter and say, all right, here's what actually happened. Now, that may be an Alistair Campbell thing, but I think that's in the nature of politics, that people are presenting a version of events. Again, we saw this in, in June 2012, there was an EU summit where the Irish government came out and said, we have been categorically promised retrospective recapitalization of the Irish banks. And they were absolutely 100% about that. When you looked at the document that was issued, that's not what it said. And it took another two years, really, before I think Joachim Pfeiffer, the, the, the economic advisor to Angela Merkel, said absolutely not. That was never even a possibility for discussion. So I think, for me, resources is obviously an issue, and we'd all love more. But I think critical thinking and the ability to attach ourselves and indeed what we want from the process and to ask the tough <coughs> questions and at all times to say, is that really what happened? Is that really what the text says? How's that actually going to work in, in practice? Because the differences there can be enormous. And I think the final thing I think the media could, could do with a little bit is a greater willingness to try and see things through the eyes of the different participants. Um, you know, I think as someone who is uh, half English, half German, lived here for 11 years, uh, applying for my citizenship now um, so that I can actually go on holiday with my family. Um, I, I think I have an ability to, to maybe look from the outside in at the English and perhaps also at the Europeans. And I think there's a tremendous lack of understanding generally of not just UK politics but of, of, of the English psyche and indeed, contrary-wise, the, 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 the Scots psyche and the role that kind of national identity, national history play in a lot of the politics and a lot of the media coverage. And I think the more we can understand where everybody is coming from, not just the, 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 the British, uh, who I think, frankly, a lot of them are struggling themselves to understand where they're coming from. But also in all of this, you know, you have to be asking, what, what does Angela Merkel want? And, and not just that, but bearing in mind the way the negotiations will ultimately have to work. You know, what does the Italian Prime Minister want out of this? What does the Commission want? And I think we need a far greater ability to try and understand the motivations of the key players in order that we can kind of correctly assess the things that are going on. So I think 
those are the, the those are the key challenges from my perspective for the media is number one the critical thinking to challenge the assumptions even where everybody says we all agree on the same thing we have to ask how is that actually going to work how is it going to affect uh, ordinary people and secondly I do think we need to put ourselves a little more in the shoes of the people whose actions we're trying to report and indeed understand and explain so those I think would be my key my key messages in terms of the media and Brexit Thank you Sebastian um, A couple of times there you talked about your responsibilities to your readers and um, uh, the, 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 the duty to your readers could I ask you to what extent do you feel your readers actually engage with much of this I mean when you look at your reader traffic through your various pages as presumably you get data back on that is this all a total turn off or, or how, would you, how would you describe the level of reader interest in the things we've just been talking about well I think you know, obviously readerships differ, and, and that'll be a different question for every editor. Uh, and, 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 and our readership is, is, is not necessarily the, the, the CEO. The number one question, I think, for most readers, in, in any issue, in particularly politics, but generally in life, is how does this affect me? How is this likely to affect me in my day-to-day -day life? Uh, so there are immediate questions. They're interested in the question of the border mm -hmm. um, and how that will work. And there's a, there's, there's a very powerful sentiment I've detected towards the notion that, 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 that there is a visceral rejection of the idea of a return to the border as was. But then you get into you know, questions of travel and work Beyond that, I think there's an obvious question, how does this affect my future livelihood? Does, th does this threaten my job in the future? So I think for my readers, it's primarily focused through the prism okay. of what is the impact likely to be for me and for the people I know, bearing in mind how many Irish people live in Britain, how many Irish people have relatives living there, and how many Irish people have at some stage worked in the UK. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll try and keep it pithy. Um, I remember this time last year, I had bronchitis. Uh, Paul and his team had just hired my deputy editor and we hadn't replaced him, uh, which meant one way or the other I had to work. Uh, we'd recorded two radio ads. One was inside Fianna Fáil's startling recovery, plus what happens after Britain said we're staying. And we had recorded another one. My God, they voted to leave, all you need to know. Uh, but we weren't planning on using that one. Most of the copy hadn't been written. Uh, because resources are tight, and you're not going to pay Pat Rabbit to write two pieces, one on either side. I see him sitting there, uh, just in case. And I remember with Bronchitis saying to my wife, I was in bed on antibiotics, if they vote to leave, just get me up. We'll go into work and we'll see, how we, we'll see how we get on. And she did, and I thought she was joking. And about a day and a half later, I came home. Uh, we put a headline on the front page that simply said, Rue Britannia, because of the impact on Ireland, was so significant. I think it's a phrase that resonated then. It's still a phrase that resonates now. And it's often struck me in the period since. Brexit has impacted absolutely everything, while simultaneously affecting nothing. Uh, because it's at the back of everybody's mind and we're looking at everything through the prism of Brexit. But all of the details and, and the esteemed panel earlier that they're talking about, about, when Catherine Day said, I'm not an expert on the customs border, I went, God, if she's not, we're all in trouble. <laughs> um, but that it really is impacting absolutely everything and nothing. So we're all looking at it through that. Catherine Day also used a phrase that, that resonated with me when she went, this really is, we're in for the long haul. And as a newspaper editor, where you have to sell papers first and foremost, and then give good content, and they, they work off each other, uh, we do run the risk of, of what I term Brexit fatigue. That if you keep on putting so much of your resources into the one topic, at what point do you worry that your readers will simply tune out and look for something entirely different? Yes, Brexit is a massive story, and we're giving it pages every week. But there is an issue at what point readers simply become 
read so much of that, I want to tune out. We saw it with the bailout, we saw it with an awful lot of the financial stories over the years. People can consume so much, and then with a process that's going to going on for a number of years, how do you sustain that level of interest? Because there is a profound disparity I've always felt between what journalists and what people in journalism school call the public interest, what the public should have an interest in, versus the antithesis of that, which is what the public actually find interesting. Uh, and it's trying to marry those two things, to try and give Brexit coverage that's both interesting and formative and on the money. And that's one of the big issues that we're having, is to try and maintain constant focus on Brexit, Brexit should I say, while not overloading the reader with too much that they simply can't take in. Uh, Connor spoke about resources. Resources is always an issue. And I remember at the time, just after it happened, we were talking, should we appoint a Brexit editor? Should we appoint a Brexit correspondent? And we felt that was the wrong thing to do. Because you're simply saying, well, now that's covered off. We've covered off Brexit. Instead, we took a decision inside that we would, all of our editors, all of our journalists should be looking at their areas through the prism of Brexit. So if it's Susan Mitchell looking at health, what does it mean for health? And what's the impact upon that? If the guys, Tom or Jack or Ian Guy, are looking at the markets or the economy or business, that they should be looking at that through the prism of Brexit and how it impacts upon it. And the same with the political staff. So we felt it was a team effort for everybody to get in behind and to make sure that we were, that we were dealing with it in that way. Uh, resources, absolutely. Would we love to have somebody, and I speak from a small newspaper here, would I love to have somebody on the ground in Brussels? Absolutely. Would we love to have somebody in London full time? Absolutely. We simply don't have the resources to allow that to happen. So while we send people across and we try and do interviews, be it with Phil Hogan or the various other people in these issues. We try and do it as best we can. And we'd love to have people on the ground in all those areas, but in the current status, it's just, it's just not possible. I think the big issue that we've been trying to do um, within our paper is to give a plurality of views, different views, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't. I think you referred to bias. Um, I remember you know, we started printing a number of articles by Ray Bassett where he was questioning <coughs> the Irish position to Brussels. Uh, and, and what we needed to be doing and what the Irish government should be doing. And it was met, I heard MEPs and TDs on Marion Fluke and say, well, it's all of you are a sceptic and the Sunday Business Post says you're a sceptic. And I was like, it's nothing of the sort. What we're trying to do is not simply to tell people one side is right and the other side is wrong, but to give people informed views across the spectrum and to allow, we trust our readers, to make up their own mind. So you give them decent viewpoints, you give them informed analysis, you give them a plurality of views, whether it's Stephen Kinsella, Michael McDool, I see here, be it Matt Cooper, Pat Rabbit, so on and so forth, give them strong views, strong analysis, and inform them in the best way that you can. And that's certainly the policy of, of, of what we do. I've always thought newspaper journalism isn't just one of the good things about it. You hire good people and let them at it, and never try to tell them what their view is, but publish good voices, good opinion, and hopefully trust your readers to make up their own minds. And that's certainly what we try to do. And I'm interested in the rest of the conversation. From a resource point of view, I would love more resources. They're unlikely to be coming. Uh, we want more plurality of views. But I think the big issue is to maintain a public interest in Brexit, to allow us to do the sort of investigations into what's going on in the negotiations, to allow that to be sustained. If nobody's reading it, that's a significant issue. Yes, it, you, when you talk about Brexit fatigue, it, it, it reminds me very much um, in the in the nineties when the when the um, peace process was, was was sort of plowing away in the north. Um, we would do in the Irish Times, we would regularly do surveys of what people read in the paper and what turned them off. And we realised our, our our researchers came back to us and told us that there were a number of trigger words that turned people off. Was one was Paisley. Um, uh, another was uh, Northern Ireland. Um, uh, another was um, clarification. Um, anything to do with the whole process, people just uh, glazed over it. And um, yet, at the same time, we had to continue to maintain a, a large staff. I see Dag Long down here uh, on the ground in conditions of some comfort and splendour. Um, <laughs> um, 
it, it, <laughs> uh, but but we knew that the readers were simply switching off. They'd had enough of it. They couldn't they couldn't take any more of it. Interestingly enough, after Northern Ireland, the next thing to turn them off was European, the EEC as it was at the time. But uh, that's that's uh, that's for another day. Um, we um, yeah, it it it, it the, the the difficulty is maintaining the focus. Uh, let's hear from David Nally, the uh, television point of view. Uh, thanks very much, Connor. Um, just to say, I had to say yes to this because it was Dan O'Brien who asked me to do it and I've been a big fan of Dan's writing for a long time and I've often uh, borrowed his analysis and opinions and tried to pass them off as my own at various meetings over the last few years. So I felt I owed him this. Um, although I enjoy the title of Managing Editor of Current Affairs, I should be clear that my job involves looking after a limited number of television programmes, Primetime, Clareburn Live, RT Investigates, and special events coverage of elections, Ordeshina, et etc., uh, and that I don't have anything to do with radio. Um, but I was listening to Morning Ireland the other morning, and they were doing something on Brexit, and I remembered, oh God, I have this coming up on Monday, and I said to my wife, Jesus, that reminds me, of, I have to talk at this conference about people's concerns about Brexit. And she said, well, I can tell you what my concern about Brexit is. She doesn't actually sound like that. <laughs> well, I said, oh, what is it? And she said, it's boring. Um, and that, not put quite so eloquently, is what I often hear back from the people who make the day-to-day -day decisions about what goes on prime time and Clareburn Live, etc. They have covered it many times, um, but they are aware from experience that it is a turn-off for viewers. Um, and you've got to bear in mind that those programs have 30 seconds at the top of the program to persuade people to watch it. They have to be aware that the Champions League is on RT2. I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here is on TV3. And the Big Bang Theory is on E4, E4 plus one, more four, more four plus one, Comedy Central, and Comedy Central plus one. <laughs> Um, so, why does it have the tag of being boring? Well, the easy answer is that it's complex and it lacks real people. Those things are true, but they're, again, they're true of a lot of things and not all of those things are considered boring. I think the better answer over the last year is that it hasn't really changed. It hasn't changed in the sense that it, the effect it has on ordinary people's lives, that that has changed. And the glacial pace of it is a problem for media. If you take a, a few of the issues in it, I'm just going to look at them as an editor of, say, Primetime or Clareburn Live would look at them and why they don't necessarily set the pulse racing. Right? The fall in sterling, right? that is something that is real, it is really happening now, and it is having real world effects. And media have covered it and the effects of it quite a lot including RT Current Affairs. It's not a news story. We are used to currency fluctuations and the damage they can do. Also, the truth about the economy is that the economy at the moment is in a recovery phase. It's growing. It's doing quite well. So that fights against making a very dramatic issue out of the fall in sterling and the economic problems that it causes. It's not like, say, the financial and banking crisis a few years ago where everything was going in the one direction, and it was a disaster. Uh, there is a bit of a myth around that that crisis period was a terrible turn-off for ratings on radio and TV. It wasn't. In fact, it was the opposite. Ratings for those kind of programs went through the roof in that period, until a general election had happened and the heat went out of it. But that period, although it was terrible, it was also very exciting and dramatic. Uh, the question of a hard border. People are concerned about that, but again, it hasn't changed over the last year. To the extent that people can tune into what's going on, all of the important people seem to be saying that it's not going to happen, and that they're quite determined to make sure that it doesn't happen. A certain amount of complacency has set in, and it does still suffer from the aversion to the words Northern Ireland that Connor spoke of. The common travel area that Sebastian spoke about, I think people accept from the start there was a lot of concern about that and a huge amount of interest in it when Brexit first was passed. 
But I think people quickly accepted that it wasn't going to happen. And again, maybe we were too complacent about that. In a more overarching sense, that it might provoke the collapse of the European Union itself. Um, again, I think there was excitement and interest <coughs> and fear about that when Brexit was first passed. People feel less nervous about that now than they did a year ago. To some extent also, they had already got used to that idea. They'd been through that fear through the Eurozone crisis. And Donald Trump, in geopolitical terms, came along and acted as a big, huge distraction. Um, I think the next time it will shoot to the top of the agenda and really engage viewers and listeners and the public is when it starts to do, if it starts to do, serious damage to the Irish economy and people start to feel it in their jobs and in their pockets. And if that happens, as you all know, it will happen maybe as a result of barriers to trade, but also maybe more likely as a result of serious damage to the British economy and that feeding into the Irish economy. That may be the real story. But again, it hasn't happened yet, and it might not happen. So in terms of the difficulties in reporting it, I'd say for RTE News, and I'm not involved directly in news, I'd say it's not really a problem. Uh, the 61 News covers about 100 stories a week, and there's plenty of room for the latest twists and turns on Brexit. It has great correspondents, Tony Connolly, Fiona Mitchell, David Murphy and Sean Whelan in Dublin, and Martina Fitzgerald, Tommy Gorman in Belfast, Ingrid Miley, who I see here. News programmes are not as rating sensitive. The news is the news. People will tune in to watch it anyway. And if the lead story is a bit boring today, there'll be another lead story tomorrow. However, it is a problem for programmes of the kind of Prime Time and Clareburn Live. If you think about it, the basic news event has been heard and discussed all day. These programs are a discretionary buy. People won't watch them if they simply report the news or if they feel that they're going to be boring. Without real people stories, what tends to be on offer is a debate which to a lot of viewers will be a bit dry and a bit academic. And unfortunately, you often find that people who criticize TV and maybe radio for <coughs> not covering thing, these things intelligently enough or in depth enough won't take part in programs like Primetime with Clareburn Live. <coughs> We've asked many times, Michel Barnier, even when he was here, Eva Hofstadt, Jean Claude Juncker, David Davis, Boris Johnson, to take part in Primetime with Clareburn Live. They won't. And we've asked did, Catherine Day, in fact, several why? times. Did you say why? What you usually get is my diary is too full. Simple as that. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, when Michel Barnier came over here, Sean might remember better, I think uh, we were told before he arrived there won't be any press interviews. Maybe there was a press conference, I'm not sure, but certainly there was no question of him appearing on a program and, and in the million to one chance that he would have appeared on a program, inevitably it would have been, I'll only appear in a one-on-one -on -one interview, I will not debate these issues with somebody else. <coughs> Even with Catherine Day, to be honest, she will not appear on Prime Time with Clare Burnett. Or, in my experience, I don't see her popping up or on radio programs or other programs. Okay. So what I'd say, RTE Current Affairs has covered Brexit several times. Um, it is a difficulty to keep saying the same thing over and over to people, especially when you can't show that it's affecting real people's lives, that it's changing, or that the big players, the big decision makers, are appearing on the programme. Thank you. Thank you. I think... Um I think what David has told us actually is, is, goes right to the heart of much of what the media are facing in, in this debate. Um, and it, it is true that, uh, and I know from my own experience here as a, as a member of the board of the Institute, that it is extraordinarily difficult to get people, whether we're talking about elected representatives or whether we're talking about um, senior officials, 
to come out of their comfort zone and actually engage with people who might have a different view uh, of the European experiment than they have. It isn't easy to get them. Um, and what we do here in the Institute, we do bring in a very, a very as you know, uh, a very eclectic and, and, and very influential often uh, series of, 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 of visitors come in here. It's difficult very often to get them to uh, do anything other than, as you say, the one-to-one -one interview. They were reluctant to engage in debate. Uh, and, and, and then at the other end, there is the issue, and I, I recall at one stage when we, had a, we were organizing a conference last year, uh, at the early stages of Brexit, endeavoring to persuade a number of broadcasters that they might take some interest in what was going on. And I explained the various people who were coming, and there was no, 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 no. And suddenly I mentioned Boris Johnson, and oh, yeah, there is a possibility. Um, so really it was, a, I suppose, a case of entertainment value and the urgent driving out the important. Um, so there's a tension there, which I think we've all got to, we've all got to get on. No, I don't think it was you, no. Maybe it was. Eh? <laughs> I wasn't taking notes. The man at the end is wearing my old suit. Uh, it fits him very well. Um, Paul O'Neill is the editor of uh, the Irish Times. Um, I'm slightly amused at Connor's uh, recollections of the 1990s when she was trying to make Northern Ireland very interesting. And he was sitting in the executive lounge on, well, we didn't quite have a seventh floor at that stage. But uh, for those of us who were down at the news desk at that stage, I'm trying to make words like Paisley and compromise. Um, <laughs> interesting, it was, it was quite a challenge. And, um, to some extent, that's, that's, that's very much still the problem. Um, I mean, on the face of it, Brexit should be a fantastic story for the media. Um, stories that would have so, such an impact on Ireland, the EU, and the UK um, should be bringing in an audience. But in reality, um, I had a look uh, at, at how our traffic, and in the brave new world of digital journalism, you can see how, uh, what people are reading and how traffic actually performs. It was much easier in the older world when people bought newspapers and you assumed they read it from cover to cover. But we've, we've published 1,000 articles uh, on Brexit in the last year. Um, and really, with the exception of the, of the weekend in and around the referendum itself, when there was obviously a huge lift in, in traffic and huge interest in it, it really has been phenomenally steady. Um, and I, I use the word steady advisedly. Um, I mean, there is interest, but it's, it really is nothing extraordinary. One of the strange things about it, though, is that um, Brexit stories uh, attract a 10% premium or 10% extra UK readership for us over and above our ordinary readership. And I suppose maybe that is illustrative in the, in the, in the wider context of the challenges facing the news media and, and finding a market and that kind of thing. It demonstrates that actually, you know, sometimes when there are borders, you can get traffic and you get an audience that you wouldn't, norm you wouldn't normally get. Um, it's very much driven by social media, and for instance, when John Callanan made the reference to uh, Seth Harriman in the UK, uh, traffic over that weekend for that story in particular was phenomenally high. Um, in terms of our capacity to deal with it, well, obviously we're 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 hugely reliant on um, on a foreign network um, that comes at considerable cost to the Irish Times, and obviously, you know, when, in the context of resources and the scrutiny on resources, it's one that we fight tooth and nail to to preserve. Um, but um, it does ha obviously have to fit into to other stories, and uh, if you look at our coverage from London over you know over the last few weeks, uh, it's fair to say that Dennis Staunton has been more preoccupied with with terrorism and uh, fires than than virtually anything to do with Brexit. Um, interesting example along the same lines, though, is that at the time of the Scottish referendum, we found that there was a huge amount of traffic for Scotland as well. And maybe there is an advantage for the Irish media that, uh, that uh, an audience in Britain who are interested in reading English-speaking content about the issue do find, or at least some of them do find, that the Irish media can provide something that they're not getting at home, in that um, uh, it's less partisan. Um, we do understand the EU probably better than their own media do. Um, and obviously, we also understand the UK. Um, the difficulty in all of this, though, and it's been reflected on earlier, is that we are set up uh, to deal with sprints rather than marathons. 
it is much easier for us to deal with uh, a terrorist attack uh, in Borough Market at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night than a two-year process um, and to actually retain an audience for that because, um, uh, you know, we love breakdowns, we love uh, <coughs> secret documents, uh, we love people falling out, um, but really it's very hard to present in an inter interesting fashion uh, incremental progress um, process um, process is exceedingly difficult um, so I think in terms of actually dealing with that issue um, if words could uh, tell the Brexit story I think it would have been fully told already I mean there has been so much uh, so much uh, so many words written about it um, I think there's an onus on us to actually try and make the story more interesting that means you obviously have to co cover the politics and you have to cover the process but you also have to cover the people and you have to tell the story in the context of people's lives and um, you have to explain and uh, that's that's exceedingly difficult to do in a scenario where where there are still so many questions and so few answers um, and obviously then there's a whole new world of fact checking which um, probably wouldn't have been on our agenda before in quite the same way in that generally if politicians spoke you would ex ex expected there to be a sense of truth in what they're saying um, and there is an onus on us now to address that and I don't mean just sort of straight bananas and that kind of thing but in a sense the straight bananas was the start of something that maybe we didn't see at the time as to uh, as to uh, uh, where we were going. Um, my very first job in the Irish Times was uh, was in the London office um, and that was 28 years ago um, and it's almost like being caught in the moment in some sort of weird time machine because um, that period was, was sort of, it was two years that was, it was the end of the Thatcher era and the start of John Major. Um, and even at that point, for most of my time there, Thatcher was so strong. Um, uh, but obviously that, that faded out over time. Uh, you know, she, she, she was as Euroskeptic as, she, as they came, but she was highly political. Uh, Euroskepticism became a huge problem for John Major. Uh, UKIP didn't exist at that time. But the British National Party did, and I mean, there's been a lot of reported over the last few weeks about Jeremy Corbyn and the Troops Out movement. One of the biggest challenges the British police had at that time was to keep the British National Party and the Troops Out uh, movements apart because they always protested at the same time. Um, there was loads of flux, there was poll tax riots. Um, in the same decade, you had the Brixton and Toxteth uh, riots. But somehow all of that flux was operating within, with certain parameters, and those parameters seem to be gone now. Um, and uh, just the, the point here, here, here is really, Connor, you raise, you raise the issue of whether the media here is biased uh, um, against Europe. Um, I think in our coverage of all of this, it will be incumbent on, us, incumbent on us to deal with, to produce a 360 degree view of all this in the, in the modern parlance because um, uh, in truth, there is a divorce underway. Um, and in every divorce there are two sides and my slight concern is that is that because the British side seems so disorganized and so chaotic at the moment that there's been very little focus on the other side of the divorce and if, ha if half the British population are prepared to vote to leave Brexit that surely has to raise issues for the EU um, and I think there are issues for us here too that you know, it, it would be. It would. I think it would be inconceivable to think that if if there was a referendum here tomorrow, that people would vote to leave to leave the EU. But at the same time, I'm not sure they'd vote for more EU. Um, and I think there's a discussion to have to be had there. And I think if you were to ask people what what do they think of when they hear about the EU, do they think of Michel Barnier in a field in Monaghan, um, or do they think of Mr. Trichet being very reluctant to answer questions? And, and, and I think in truth, I think we probably know what, what their instinctive answer would be. So I do think there are issues for the, the EU there. Um, and in terms of where we go over the next two, two years in trying to reflect on this story, we need to do all of it so that it's, not bi not, it's certainly not biased, but that it, it deals with all the issues for Britain, for us, and for the EU itself. Thanks, thanks Paul. It, it just strikes me listening to you and um, Marking back to, to, to David before that, it's just important to remember that while broadcasters like David have a statutory obligation to balance in coverage of this and any other topic really, uh, there isn't a similar statutory requirement on 
print media, of course. Um, so I, I, I suppose um, I suppose probably the 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 word that one would reach for probably would be fairness rather than balance. And I guess when both sides are accusing you of being biased against them, you probably achieve a degree of fairness in it. So that sounds okay. Um, Fanon, we go across the river to independent news and media. I will hear, do things look any different from over there? Yeah, welcome to the north side. <laughs> um, I'm looking for the collective noun for a group of editors and I'm hoping none of the journalists will answer, but I know that <laughs> subconsciously uh, okay. Sebastian sat on the right, uh, Paul sat on the left, and here I am stuck in the middle with you. <laughs> when I think, when I think, the liberal alliance. Yeah, when I think of Brexit, I'm, I kind of go back to my own time in college studying European affairs. I think of what uh, Voltaire said. You mentioned a journey at the start, and he said, uh, je ne sais pas où je vais, mais j'y vais. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. And that very much sums up, I think, uh, our own readers and everybody else's view upon Brexit. We, don't, we know we're engaged in a process, but we don't actually know uh, what the finish point is. So I see our role uh, as the Irish Independent, as the, as the largest newspaper in the country, very much to be a guide for our readers about what exactly is happening. I have to say, I'm going to disagree strongly with anybody who suggested that Brexit is a boring topic. Uh, I think what happened 12 months ago was a game changer for people across this country. And if we're not going to cover a topic like that comprehensively and throw an all, any and all available resources at it, then I don't know why we are in journalism, to be quite <coughs> frank. Uh, in our own case, in the Irish Independent and, I, and in INM, I agree upon the resources issue, but I think it is a topic that has to be covered right across the board by everybody. It affects every single journalist and correspondent uh, in our newspaper. We actually decided to appoint a specific Brexit correspondent for the very reason, I suppose, a Paul outlined there, things can fall through the cracks because other correspondents, your political correspondents, will be sucked into the Fine Gael leadership debate. So that takes them out of the loop uh, for uh, a month. The banking <coughs> correspondent and the, and the business correspondents will be stuck in the AIB flotation for a week, so anything that happens is lost. So Colin Kelpie was appointed a year ago as our, as our Brexit correspondent. And I think it was a, a far-sighted decision. I think it was, it was taken by, it was proposed by Dorothy McDonald's group business editor. I, it, Stephen Ray and herself and the editor-in-chief proposed that there would be one. We discussed who it should be. Colin got the, the, uh, the poison chalice, I suppose. But that's a, it was a long-term decision. I think it was the right one. Um, he has the added advantage which we didn't actually see at the time that he's from the north, so he actually brings a different perspective to it. But that didn't actually come into play at the time, but it's actually, I think, it's, it's, it's helped along the way because he, he has a, a unique understanding in that regard. But I mean, just last week we decided it was a week on, a year on since the, the Brexit vote. So we'd look at across the board. So where, where are we at? Uh, so we looked at everything from the border, transport, agriculture and food, education, health, law, trade, banking, jobs. Every single aspect brought all our correspondents, all of our columnists in, into that frame and said, right, so where, where do you think we're at? Where do you think things are going here? And I have to say, we found there is that difficulty of how do you illustrate it to real people? We found there's actually no shortage of real people out there who will be directly affected by Brexit and who are very much concerned about it. Uh, everybody from Mary Rafferty above in Clonus, County Monaghan, who's living in what's called the We Republic, because it's a little enclave of County Monaghan that juts mm -hmm. into, into County Fermanagh. She's a pretty extreme case. She remembers the days of the butter smuggling simply by going down to her local shop. But there was a, guy, a small businessman down in Cork who was like exporting up in partnership with a company up in Belfast, and he's now wondering what's going to happen. There was a guy in Galway who was, who was exporting uh, and importing to, to Germany, and he's now wondering, well, if I have to go to the north because I'm, I'm currently shipping through Larne, what exactly is going to happen to me then? So particularly uh, in any of the, the, the business, trade, and the farming community, there is an insatiable appetite within the farming community for anything to do with Brexit because they can see probably for, uh, how it is going to directly impact upon them uh, over the coming years. And yeah, they are wondering what exactly is going to happen down the line and that's, that's why we're, we're try, trying to uh, inform them. In terms of our coverage of, of the issue, I, I think it is important and I, I think Sebastian was right in terms of the appointment of a Brexit minister. I was happy to see that Simon Coveney's position had been bumped up a bit, but actually disappointed to see that there wasn't a, a, a direct Brexit minister appointed, nor a direct department of Brexit. 
put in similar to the one that Eamon Gilmore installed uh, in 2011 when, when he created, in effect, a new uh, Secretarial General in the, jointly between the Department of Taoiseach and the Department of Foreign Affairs to restore Ireland's reputation at that particular point in time. I don't think it would have been any harm this time around for a similar structure to be put in place between the, the Taoiseach's office and, and Foreign Affairs to, to specifically handle Brexit. But we see how that proceeded. I, th I think the, the notion that all of it could, be, could have been handled through the Taoiseach's department, as was being proposed by Andy Kenny, was, was farcical in, in, in the extreme, and I'm glad that they've, they've changed the tack there. I think what we're also looking at is what exactly is, are the, the pragmatic and practical implications uh, of Brexit? So when we get to the point where, let's say, there is no border installed, how exactly are we going to ensure that trade between North and South can actually thrive rather than being sucked back uh, simply because there, are, there is some level of administration put in place? So practical issues such as improving the, 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 the road network North and South, including the railway network, I think that's a role that I see our paper is playing, just these are the practical steps uh, that we have to take. If there is an, an issue, a more philosophical issue, around which I am concerned, it is what exactly happens to the European Union after the, department, the, the departure uh, of the bridge. And I think Paul brought th th that up as well, because one can see it being dominated probably by, by two uh, uh, particular European countries and probably in, in cooperation with the, with the European Council. Travelling over and back to uh, Brussels for about a decade to European Council meetings, there were, there were three things that, that came across as a pattern during that time. The first one was the, the Frit inside in the Justice Lipsium, Lipsus uh, canteen or amongst the finest in Brussels, you'd have to say, even for a canteen. The second one was and the Kenny's press conference was always the last to start, we believed, because it was taking his officials so long to tell him what to say, that it actually allowed us to go along to um, other press conferences by, held by, by other uh, leaders from across Europe. And on one particular occasion, I was, I was at the back of a, a Sarkozy press conference, uh, listening to what was being said, standing beside three British journalists, who were sniggering away all the way through it, because they were relating every single thing that he said they were regarding as a dig at the British, interpreting it in that fashion. And I was sit standing there listening to him at one point uh, talking about, I believe it was a, a, a fire brigade workers strike. And these three guys were relating everything that he was saying was somehow a dig at the British. I just thought that that, that was quite an astonishing example. But over the course of the 10 years, there was a familiar pattern. Over the course of the week, European Council meeting, you had proposals coming forward the British would kick up on the, the Wednesday, the Thursday, and on that Thursday night you would see somebody coming out from Downing Street blatantly onto the floor of the, the European Council building saying, this is what we've got, this is what Britain has forced the EU not to do. And they'd go away with their little concession and that's how it would be reported the following day and people would move on. Now, on the one hand you'd say, well, what did the British block and what, what did they hold back? On the flip side, you you would actually say, well, what is now going to proceed and what is now going to get through? And I think that's, that's a broader debate that probably Europe as a whole uh, is, is going to have to examine uh, beyond the departure of Britain from it. Okay, we, um, the coffee is in preparation. We kicked off a few minutes late. So i um, take five minutes, six, seven minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, I Do want you? to make those high. I think most of you know me, Sarah Carey, presenter of Talking Point on News Talk. Um, I want to make the case against drama. Um, and I thought your comments were particularly uh, revealing, David, and interesting. I think the reason those people won't come on TV programs is because they know that the end game and the goal of the producer is to get some drama, to get them to say something embarrassing. Um, to cr say something that will make the headlines the next day in the paper. That would be a score, that would be a win. And I, I'm not particularly getting at you in this, this is the whole way broadcasting, of which I'm a part, actually works. I think TV has huge opportunities to uh, make an impact on Brexit without trying to embarrass uh, the next person that comes on the show, number one being visual. I am still trying to get my head around um, single market, customs union, membership EU, EFTA, EEA, all of these things. And I keep wanting someone to put up uh, one of those sets 
that we used to do in maths in secondary school, where you could see all the stuff um, uh, overlying. And I think you have a huge opportunity to do explainer stuff and really show people how um, all of this is unfolding and how it could work. And uh, Sebastian has been on my show a few times, so you know we don't set up uh, polarized conversations. You know, we try to set up something that's a bit more analytical. Obviously, you disagree some, you know, sometimes, but you can unpeel, unpeel layers of stuff and what you were saying about you've got the German perspective, you were speaking to the Finns, there's all of that that can be done. And I think the media is still too caught up in this polarised thing of um, have a pop at Enda Kenny, uh, did we get the Brexit minister, sneer at the Brits, that we can do so much more, but we still think a polarised, contrived argument, sticking Ray Bassett in with the columnist, is inserting drama into it because that's what we need. And I think what's unfolding is dramatic enough and we're not serving people by sticking to this polarized formula. Good. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Anybody else? Question? Comment? God, this is amazing. Such has been the eloquence, persuasiveness <laughs> and conclusiveness of this panel of people up here. Joe Carroll, um, I did cover Ireland's entry into negotiations and probably the only person here who did that. Um, it went on for two years and actually Ireland was facing wipeout and things like textiles, car assembly, fisheries, except that the farmers knew they were on to good things. And politically, we knew it was going to be better in Europe than out. And yeah, the point I was going to say, I also worked in the EU Commission for four or five years in spokesman's group. And the document that the commissioners read most avidly every morning was called the Revue de la Presse. And that was a set up there was somebody sitting in each capital, coming in very early in the morning, not getting well paid for it, and faxing over the main headlines from that country, and then also faxing over the articles that were most interesting to do with that. Of course, there was an emphasis on the EU. Now, it struck me listening to what's happening here, that what we will badly need, what the ordinary person who's interested or not so ordinary, will be almost that kind of a digest, which I don't know who's going to provide it, but now with the a website, this is the obvious thing. So that people who are interested but can't read all the papers, but know that there's important sure. stuff in the papers, that somebody will bring it together for them. I think that's going to be very important. Somebody here I used think the somebody term, should do it. Somebody in the institute here used the term the Fisher Price version of the, of the news in the morning. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Anybody else, or are we going for coffee? Sorry, Paul, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Yeah. No, uh, just a word in favour of process. Uh, your correspondents give this uh, routine. People, readers know this. Uh, one of the, surely one of the functions of, uh, of a coverage is to, uh, is to prepare people for the jumps, for the surprises. Um, uh, and, and that's a matter of, of, of orchestrating the, the different levels of interest that people were talking about. But surely, in part of the DNA of the serious work, uh, must be that uh, running coverage yes. of, of the process. And indeed, I agree also. I think the process can be much more, made much more interesting than it normally is. Uh, the various committees, where the decision-making uh, networks, and that can be done in special terms. And that, again, is, is part of the elementary work of the community. Anybody on the panel want to get a last comment in anything before we finish? No? Okay, it's cafe in time. Thank you, uh, members of the panel. Thank you.